Okay, and welcome back. So today we're going to talk about the classic culture of the Maya. So just to remind you where the Mayan sphere is, there it is. We're basically talking about the Yucatan Peninsula, which is usually described as uh, the northern flatlands or lowlands, the southern lowlands, which are basically the, the middle section, and then the southern highlands, which is going to get into Guatemala and into Honduras and El Salvador. So the Maya are the classic, classic civilization. It's pretty much the culture that defined uh, the classic civilization when Catherwood and other of these early scholars were uh, investigating the region. These were the sites that captivated them in the 1840s. These were the places that they were making lithographs of. And so this is why we center the classic period around the Maya. The Maya, of course, have a very long history. There's there in the pre-classic formative region. In the southern highlands, they are there from a very early period, from about 300 BC up to about 100 CE. But beginning around 250, 300 CE, we enter the classic period. And we break that down into early and late classic. The late classic, about 600, 900 CE, is generally regarded as the high point of Mayan civilization. That's where we see the most villages. That's where we see the most temple complexes, the most sculpture, etc. And then we have a collapse. Um, something happens to the Maya, and the Maya who were located mostly in the southern highlands and the southern lowlands just disappear. Those centers, the famous sites such as Tikal, Copan, all of those completely collapse and they are never ever reoccupied ever again. And then they move north into the Yucatan. Uh, and that's the period that we call, sometimes it's called late or terminal classic or post classic. It has many different names depending on the literature. There isn't an agreement, but it's basically after that high point. And it runs up until about 1300 when we have another uh, complete and total collapse, and this time the collapse is 100%, and we do not see the rebuildings of any kind of civilizations that exist. So this is the period we're talking about, um, this basically thousand-year period just after the time of uh, the beginning of the Common Era, and then a little bit into about the year 1300. But 1300 or so, there, all of these cities are gone. Now, the Maya don't disappear when the Spaniards show up. There's still thousands upon thousands of Maya there, but they are now living in villages in the forests and are at fields, and the old ceremonial centers and temples are long since gone. The, the big, powerful dynasties, this golden age of temples and ceremonial centers, by that point, had been abandoned for at least a couple centuries. Now, where the Maya come from is a bit of a mystery. No one's entirely certain. Uh, one is that they are native to the region. There's lots of native cultures that had settled in this region. Uh, there are several dialects of Mayan, not just one. So Yucatec is the dialect spoken up in the, in the Yucatan, but down in the southern lowlands and into the southern highlands, you have the Quiche language, which is what the Popol Vuh was originally written into. And the evidence is that these people are the people that have always lived there. Um, there's uh, nothing else that we can find, this, the source for these kind of ethno-linguistic groups. So it suggests that the people just pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. Maybe they adopted some culture from the Olmec, that seems likely, but they were the people that were living there before and they're the people that are still living there today. There's still lots of Mayan people. There's still lots of Mayan speakers. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of people that still speak Mayan as a uh, primary language. The other option is that they're they're not native, that they come out from some other place. The Olmecs are collapsing around 300 CE. Strangely, that's about the time that the, the uh, Maya gets started. So it's entirely possible that we have some population that export uh, their civilization to this territory and then they just flourish. Of course, it could be a mix of both. We could have had a group of elites fleeing the collapse of the Olmec civilization. They would have moved into the Mayan zone. They would have become the elites of the new populations. So the vast majority of the people would have been Maya, but you may have had these Olmec elites that brought them things like 
ball courts, pyramids, jaguar masks, rain and maze deities, calendars, and number systems. It's really hard to tell. The one thing we do know is that the Maya do venerate the Olmec, because we find Olmec artifacts strung throughout the Mayan zone. Uh, Michelle Rich, who was a friend of mine, uh, was, a, uh, was on a dig, and she actually, in a Mayan tomb, found an Olmec jade figure, a greenstone figure. And there was no doubting that it was one of those classic Olmec figures, much like we, we saw at the offering at Laventa, with those figures and those Celts put all together uh, under packed white sand. So that thing was hundreds of miles from home and probably a thousand years removed from its original context. So if you have Maya venerating Olmec objects, you know, a thousand years later, hundreds of hundreds of miles away, that's evidence that they saw some kind of kinship with the Olmec, that they saw and venerated this great civilization. Stylistically, in terms of art history, there's also a lot of kinship. When we look at the Maya, the Maya has a love for the organic, the naturalistic, the curvilinear, and those are characteristics we see amongst the Olmec. Those are not things we see in Teotihuacan or elsewhere. So while we see the influence of Teotihuacan in places like Tikal and elsewhere, it's very clear this is influence coming down, but it's an import. This is not a native culture. But there's a lot more kinship between the Olmec and the Maya. What do I believe? I honestly don't know what to believe. Lots of experts I know really can't answer this. I think the most likely scenario is that we have a native population of people there that are heavily influenced by some kind of elite group that come out of the collapse of the Olmec civilization that bring the civilization to them. But it's entirely possible that this is native and they just see this other culture and highly venerate it. So let's take a look at this territory. So the pre-classic Maya sites are going to be in what we call the Southern Lowlands. This is where you'll find Nakbe, El Mirador, San Bartolo. This is kind of the heartland of the Maya. It's predominantly in Guatemala, but a little bit in Belize, a little bit in Mexico. And from this area, we have an expansion outward. And that expansion goes all the way into southern Mexico and into the Guatemala highlands. And so this becomes the Mayan heartland. So the high point of the Mayan civilization from 600 to 900 CE, this is the area we're talking about. And then you have a collapse. We'll talk more about the reasons for the collapse or what the collapse represented. And these areas are quickly abandoned. The urban centers are abandoned. They're consumed by the jungle. No one comes back to them. But we have a whole new flourishing up here in the Yucatan, in what we call the Northern Lowlands. And this is the area where we have Chichen Itza, Uxmal, uh, Chenez, uh, you know, the Rio Beck style, all of these places. So let's talk about some of these early sites. Some of the earliest sites we have, some of these early pre-classic formative structures we're going to find in Guatemala. This is Nakbe. And these are the so-called Mammon buildings. They are low profile buildings. Uh, platforms, obviously ceremonial platforms of some kind, and they are faced with limestone. One of the reasons that we have so many Mayan monuments is that while other uh, cultures in the region built their monuments out of earth or rammed earth, uh, the Mayan, which also built out of rammed earth, liked to cover their um, monuments in limestone. Limestone's a little bit easier to cut than basalt, uh, and uh, it's a little bit more accessible. And so therefore, it's just a little bit easier to carve. And so maybe that's why we have so much more artistic expression, is that the available carts topography gives lots of sources of limestone that can be used. So we see these low buildings faced in limestone. One of the earliest sites that we see is El Mirador. El Mirador is, again, mostly consumed by the jungle today. But that's kind of a misrepresentation. We tend to think of these things as being in the jungle, but remember that they were surrounded by miles and miles of cultivated land. So the jungle would have been cleared. There wouldn't have been any trees. They would have been vast open plazas and, and uh, complexes. This is El Mirador here, and the buildings were again made out of rammed earth, faced in limestone, but the limestone itself would have been covered in a thick layer of stucco that itself would have been painted. 
uh, sometimes painted white, sometimes painted in vibrant color or cinnabar, such as you see here. And then this would have been decorated in stucco. So here you have, again, remember, each one of these pyramids is itself a Russian doll, and underneath there is another pyramid. So the pyramid on the outside is in very, very bad shape. Uh, the jungle doesn't preserve things terribly well. But the pyramid on the inside, we have this absolutely pristine stucco work that shows just how elaborate they were. Notice we still have this kind of talud and tablero kind of tiered system that exists. One of the other earlier sites we see is San Bartolo. San Bartolo looks like a hill today, but it's in fact a pyramid, and itself too has many, many layers. Here's a kind of diagram showing all the different layers. And one of the things about going into these layers is the layers preserve, in this case, some really amazing murals. So here we have some of the earliest evidence of pre-classic cultures. So by the pre-classic period, they're, they're building large-scale pyramids. They are decorating them with stucco and color. They have uh, murals. And in those murals, you can see glyphs, symbols, writing. Uh, and really, we're seeing that a lot of this culture just seems to pop up the ground very, very early. And that's a strong suggestion that maybe it is imported from the Olmec. That, you know, they have a, a fully formed culture with titles and glyphs, etc. So let's talk a little bit about Mayan society, Mayan polity. It's very important to know that none of these Mayan sites are cities. When we looked at Teotihuacan, there are just dozens of these palaces, these enclosed compounds with rooms and courtyards. It was obvious that you know 50,000 people were living right there next to the urban and sacred center. That doesn't seem to be the case in any of the Mayan sites. The actual population of these urban sacred centers are very, very small. You have elites, kings, priests, priestesses, maybe merchants in the sacred precinct, but most of the people are actually living in villages in the hinterland, and most of their architecture is actually going to be made out of mud brick. And so we're actually only seeing a tiny portion of the population. Almost the entire land was denuded of forests and would have been planted in corn and crops. And you could think of it as kind of low rolling hills with a village every once in a while. And these villages would congregate at the sacred centers for festivals, for sacrifice, for market days, those kind of things. But they weren't there every day. They would come together to build them, etc. So you don't have big powerful cities. You have small little city-states that are very militarily powerful in their area, but basically rely on a whole bunch of loose confederations that come together. You have dynastic elites and kings and priests at the top, and that also includes scribes. Scribes are writers, and as near as we can tell, all of the scribes and artists are noble in class, because that seems to be a very uh, elite profession. And there's intense competition amongst these. This is from the Bonham Pack murals, and here you can see the ruler. The ruler has one of those jade masks on his chest. He's wearing fabulous uh, jaguar uh, skins, and you can see that the people are bleeding. They have bitten their own fingers, and they're offering blood to him as a way of propitiating him in the hopes that they will not become sacrificial victims. So a lot of the artwork is going to be based on domination, on political domination, on war. War was ritualized. In fact, at uh, Kalukmul, uh, Kawil writes this wonderful inscription where he says, Blood was pooled and the skulls of the people of the central place of Tikal were piled up. That's just freaking awesome. Oh my gosh. Uh, the Mesoamerican sphere is just the most metal sphere in the world. Vikings think they're metal. They can't even compete. Um, and so you have these ostentatious displays of rulers in feathers and finery with these masks on their chests, emblems representing death and domination, scenes of ritual sacrifice. Uh, the principal reason that people went to war was not over resources, but it seemed to be to dominate their neighbors to collect prisoners of war so they could offer them as sacrifice. That's really uh, kind of bloody awful, but 
it was so competitive, and it led to this incredible flourishing in Golden Age amongst the Maya. We do have Mayan writing and inscriptions at these sites, and that allows us to piece together some of the alliances in history. This diagram is dizzyingly complex. I won't bother to go into it, but take a look at it, if you will, because it shows the connection between each of the major cities, um, where there was an actual conflict, where there was uh, an alliance, where there was something that was either diplomatic or a union by marriage. And for the longest time, the Mayan sphere didn't make any sense to me because you have all these warring city-states, yet all this amazing, amazing art. How is it that they were so warlike and yet had time for art? And it struck me, I knew this story because this is in fact the same story of the Italian Renaissance. During the Italian Renaissance, Italy is in a unified country. You've got all these city-states. You've got uh, Pisa and, and Padua and... Florence and Siena and Genoa, and they all hate each other. <laughs> they all absolutely despised each other. They constantly went to war with each other. There were all kinds of bloody alliances and backstabbing. And yet, this is the environment where the Renaissance happened. That, you know, it's, it's not peace and prosperity that necessarily lead to great art. Sometimes it's competition. And so building these temples is a form of social competition. It's not just, you know, we go and conquer you. We conquer you, then we make big monuments about how we conquered you. So this dynamic moment that lasted for several hundred years is what really creates the, the beautiful art and uh, competitive nature of the Maya. Which brings us to Mayan religion. So there's so much to talk about here, I can't belabor it, but let me just give you the basics. Uh, for the longest time, we had no real concrete understanding of Mayan religion uh, outside of some basics. But then uh, a book was discovered uh, and this book was discovered uh, and it was written down in the 18th century uh, by Francisco Jimenez and it was an attempt to translate from the Quiche Maya their creation myth. The book wound up in collections, it was largely ignored and it wasn't until people started taking seriously the Maya and kind of trying to decode the Mayan script, that people looked at this story and realized, holy crap, this is the legend of the Quiche Maya. Now, again, the Quiche Maya are not the Yucatec Maya, so even just a hundred miles away, it could be a completely different origin story. But it seems reflective of most of the Mayan beliefs. It's the same thing as like, we don't really know the beliefs of, say, Tiwanaku or Wari, but we project onto them based on what we know of Andean belief and the Quechua Indians. Same thing here. So we're projecting based on this, this story, but it does give us a sense. And it is the creation myth of the world. And the basic creation myth of the world details the creation of, of the Mayan universe. And what's interesting is that it's a universe that's on edge. The Mesoamerican view of the universe, this is true in the Aztec view as well, Unlike the Andean universe, which is kind of stable, laid down by Viracocha, and you know, it's kind of permanent and forever, the Mesoamerican understanding of the universe is the universe is tenuous at best. The gods create the world not just once, not just twice, but four times, and we're actually in the fourth iteration of the creation. Uh, the gods come out, shaper, framer, grandmother, uh, grandfather, uh, and they create the world and in the creation of the world, uh, first, the object is to create beings that will worship the gods appropriately. Uh, but the first time they do it, uh, well, the first three times, they mess it up. <laughs> One time they make men out of mud, and the men of mud have no sense, and they don't worship the gods, and so they destroy that universe. Another time they make men out of wood, but the men of wood um, are like robots, and they destroy the world, and they have no sense of... Of, of propriety, etc. So a few of those get turned into monkeys and the rest are kind of get destroyed. And then we have this next creation myth, which is the creation myth of the story of the hero twins. Now the hero twins are actually the story of two pairs of hero twins. And I'm just gonna give you the briefest story here. So you have two guys who are born, Han Hanapu and Vukub Hanapu, uh, one hunter and seven hunter. And they are great heroes, and they are descended from the first gods. 
And they go out and they do have a number of, of great achievements. And their achievements attract the attention of the lords of Shibulba. And the lords of Shibulba are these terrifying uh, lords that live in the underworld. Things like Flesh Eater and Blood Drinker. They have just incredible names. <laughs> and they uh, and they say, wow, uh, these uh, two hero twins are really screwing up the universe and we, we want to make sure that we dominate them. So they lay a trap for them and they say, hey, come down to the underworld and we will give you this, if you play a ball game with us, we will give you this magical ball equipment to play the ball game. And so they agree, but the Lords of Shibulba are, in addition to being really creepy characters, are also dirty rotten cheats and they kill uh, one hunter and seven hunter. Han Hanapu and Vukub Hanapu. And so what ends up happening is they take the head of one hunter and they put him in a tree. And the tree is, is often, you know, a, a calabash tree, a gourd tree, but sometimes it's other things. It may be a saber tree. It's kind of hard to tell. And this tree often takes on aspects of the world tree. Uh, there is a saber or world tree kind of phenomenon that exists in the Mayan world as well. And one of the daughters of the lords of Shibulba, uh, Kakishk, uh, comes along and sees the head of Han Hanapu, and he spits into her hand, and this impregnates her. So the decapitated head of Han Hanapu spits into her hand, and this miraculously impregnates her. And now she is pregnant, and so because she is now pregnant, the lords of Shibulba wonder, how did you get pregnant? So she flees, and she flees to the overworld, where she goes in with her, you know, essentially mother-in-law, uh, the mother of Han uh, Hanapu. And she gives birth to two more twins. So this is the second set of twins. Now this group of twins are essentially the son and nephew of the first twins. And their names are Hanapu, Hunter, and Shablanke, which is jaguar deer or spotted deer, if you prefer. And these guys, because they are descendants of the first hero twins, and because they are descendants of the lords of Shibulba themselves, are like magicians. They understand magic and everything else. And they go on a whole series of adventures. They do all kinds of crazy things. There's a strange interlude where they turn their kind of half-brothers into howler monkeys. <laughs> they kill, um, they kill uh, Seven Macaw, this kind of monstrous demon bird character. Uh, and all kinds of things happening. And likewise, they draw the attention of the lords of Shibulba, who say, wow, uh, you know, the, the second pair of twins is just as bad as the first pair of twins. We gotta, we gotta own these guys. So again, they say, hey, we have your father's ball equipment. Come down, fight uh, in a ball game with us, and we, if you win, we will give you your father's ball uh, equipment. And the two come down, and of course, the lords of Shibulba are dirty, rotten cheats, and they try to cheat them, and they actually do succeed, and they end up killing uh, Hanapu and Shibonke, uh, you know, uh, hunter and spotted deer, jaguar deer. And yet, because they have magic, and they are part of the descendants of the lords of Shibulba themselves, they have power over the underworld, and they resurrect themselves, which scares the living <laughs> crap out of the lords of Shibulba. And then, then they basically kick butt, take names, and they order the universe. And so they lock away the underworld forever. They establish the heavens. And Hanapu becomes the sun and gives order to the universe. And spotted deer, jaguar deer, becomes the moon. So if you look up the moon, you see spots. That's the spotted deer. That's what they interpreted the dots of the moon, the spotted, the mares, the, the dark patches on the moon which is really a fun idea. And so because they are the sun and the moon, they give order to the universe, they create time, and all of the order is given to the universe. Now, this is interesting because there's several events of death, destruction, and rebirth in this story. And death is a necessary part of the story. Without the death, the universe does not cre get created, the heroes never twins, never prove themselves, and order never comes to the universe. So here we see them in the underworld. Notice they're holding their ball equipment. Here are some of the lords of Shibulba again. But this explains one of the major features of Mayan and Mesoamerican philosophy. This idea that bloodletting is an everyday occurrence and an everyday event that must take place to order the universe. Um, 
And from this come the first true men. And the men are made out of masa, out of cornmeal, and blood. And so men themselves are the product of blood. And by blood, the universe is over, ordered. So the understanding is the universe is like on the edge of a razor. It could tip into chaos at any moment. To keep it balanced and to keep it from falling, the gods must be propitiated with blood. The gods gave their lives for the creation and the ordering of the universe. Therefore, we give blood back to the gods to keep the universe in order. And so sacrifice and bloodletting is a very, very common scene in lots of Mesoamerican art, but particularly in Mayan art. You have this wonderful scene here. This is Shield Jaguar, uh, another baby name uh, if you're considering, if you're expecting. Uh, name a kid, uh, you know, Shield Jaguar. And here he is holding a torch, and he is holding a torch in an act of blessing uh, and purification over Lady Shok. And Lady Shok here is this character right here who is kneeling and notice that she's kneeling in front of a bowl and in the bowl is um, Hoon. Hoon is fig bark paper and on that you can see there are little glyphs and notice that I have a detail here in case you can't quite see this she is running a rope with barbs on it through her tongue. <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, she's not a piercing enthusiast. <laughs> this is something that they did on a regular basis. And in fact, bloodletting on the part of nobles and kings was probably a daily occurrence. And this blood will drip down the rope onto the fig bark paper, the hoon bark paper, and it will be burned, which is why he's bringing the torch. And this will be an offering to the ancestors, this will be an offering to the gods, and this will allow you to see visions, to order the universe, to make the universe right. And the kings are not even themselves exempted from sacrifice. Uh, and if you think this is severe, uh, that she's piercing her tongue with a, with a barbed rope, uh, it was common practice that the king would pierce his penis with a uh, stingray spine. So they would take a stingray spine and he would pierce his penis repeatedly to bleed on, on bark paper. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, don't sign me up for being king, uh, Ahau. Uh, don't sign me up for being a, a ruler, Ahau, of, the, of any Mayan city. So bloodletting, sacrifice, are always going to be these very, very important features that exist in all of these uh, societies that we see. And rebirth is a major part of that. You can see that. So this is Lady Ka'abal Shuk um, and the Vision Serpent. Here is Ka'abal Shuk. This is the lady right here. You can see that she is making an offering. The offering is right here. And it is, again, another bowl full of hoon uh, fig bark paper with the glyphs written on it, drenched in the blood of either a victim or herself, uh, probably herself in this context. And you can see that it's burning. And this is a smoke serpent. Again, anything that writhers, anything that moves, um, is personified as a serpent, so lightning, uh, rain, wind, uh, and of course blood are personified as serpents. And the serpent is opening up his mouth here, and out of the mouth comes the spirit of an ancestor who is there to bless and give divination in this case. So blood is how you uh, honor the ancestors, it's how you gain access to divination and to mysteries, and it's also how you keep the universe from tipping into chaos. You can see that everywhere you go in the Mayan sphere, that you have these scenes of life and death, and caves and temples are seen as passages to Shibulba, passages to the underworld. And so preservation of the body is going to be important in the afterlife. We're going to see jade masks uh, and, or images that represent them, grave goods, uh, and also mummification to a limited degree. Uh, we're also going to see ancestral worship, dynastic succession. So when we're going to talk in detail about Pakal's you know, tomb here and the iconography of this tomb lid. But one of the things I like is this altar from Copan. And the altar 
has around it a sequence of ancestors. There are 16 ancestors, four on each side, and they are all seated on cushions. What I love about this is the cushions are actually the glyphs that spell their names. So you know exactly who each of these people are. And so this altar exists as a way, again, of reviving your ancestors so that they are constantly present with you, so that these ancestors can guide you. I love how they're all seated on cushions that are, you know, the glyphs. It shows the great imagination of the Mayan scribes and artists. And you can really see this in Mayan glyphs. Now, Mayan is a language that's only really been decoded since the 1990s. Uh, it's taken a long time for people to get on this. For the longest time, people thought it was undecipherable uh, and that it would never be interpreted. And many people had some very crazy ideas about the Mayan. I don't know how with all these images of sacrifice and death and killing, but for a long time, the thinking was, oh, they were just peaceful philosopher kings and astronomer kings. <laughs> turns out not so much. No, uh, turns out they were pretty violent. Uh, Mayan is such an interesting writing language because it uses ideograms. Ideograms are, of course, symbols that represent concrete concepts. So you have one symbol to a single word, much like modern Chinese, but it also can represent syllables or phonetic sounds like an alphabet. Uh, it's important to know that there are several Mayan languages, uh, but the people in Kalakmul did not speak the same language that they spoke in Copan. And not only are there several dialectical variations, there are several script by variations. So you could write a letter different in one part of the world <laughs> than the other in the Mayan world. So a glyph that means something like fire uh, in, you know, say Copan might be a completely different glyph in Tikal. So studying Mayan is insanely difficult. The most you can do is kind of Get a, get a sense of one of the dialectical or script variations and uh, you know and then kind of use tables to kind of sort your way through it it makes translation very very hard it also demonstrates that scribes were very much high status individuals and I'm gonna just briefly explain this but every Mayan glyph is made up of several different parts it has a main sign which is kind of the root of the word and then it has other parts that are added that change or inflect the, the spelling. So a glyph could be an idea, but it also could be a word. So this is actually a word written together in all of these different pieces that come together. But there's no reason why it has to be written this way. So another scribe in another uh, town could change the suffix and use two other modifiers to make the same word. That means there's an awful lot of artistic freedom in making these glyphs, and that means, and they would, they would, they almost act like concrete poetry. If they want to emphasize something, well, they'll use a bat's head here instead of a frog, and they'll, they'll swap out pieces here and there to, to fit the context. Oh, so there's, there's, there's so many levels in reading Mayan. It's just insane. One is what it actually says, and then there's the kind of picture concrete poetry of the thing itself, which adds connotations and flavors, and we're only starting to get a little bit of it. Oh my gosh. Uh, there were Mayan books, and we know that there were thousands of Mayan books. Only four of these survive today, actually three and a partial one. This is the Madrid Codex. This is a fragment of the Dresden Codex. And the only reason these survived is because they were taken to European collections before um, Catholic monks decided to purge all of these manuscripts because they saw them as demonic. The loss of information there is, is really, really tragic. So imagine trying to decipher a language based on you know, four manuscripts and a bunch of inscriptions. I'll never forget that uh, one of my Mayan professors said, he gave us a very fun assignment. He said, okay, you're all gonna go for a walk around this town, and what I want you to do is to uh, look at the monuments, and I want you to assume you know nothing and only infer what you can infer from the monuments. And I thought, yeah, this is gonna be easy. And then I realized, oh my gosh, the monuments are so selective. 
they only talk about so you know I mean yeah this pioneer was here and and oh this historical monument was here and this etc here so if you limited yourself to official inscriptions you only get a smattering of their culture uh, I did this in Texas and about the only thing I could say was iconographically the icon iconographically the five pointed star and the outline of the shape of Texas are very important to these people. <laughs> that was like the only thing that matched. Everything else was just oh you know it was really hard to do. And so he says, well that's what we're doing when we're doing in in Mayanology. We're we're trying to recreate things based on an incredibly fragmentary set of knowledge. Uh, undoubtedly the Mayan had histories. Undoubtedly they had natural histories and books of all types, but the kind that survive are essentially calendars, or more appropriately, divination manuscripts. They are calendars, but we could think of them as astrological charts, but not astrological charts in the way we count astrological charts. That you would look at the day, and this would tell you what gods to worship on the day, but also when it was a good time to start a harvest, do this or that, or any other kind of divination that existed. And all of this centered around the Mayan calendar. So the Mayan calendar is an extraordinarily complex calendar, and no one to this day has quite come up with the logic of why it is the way it is. Uh, but, you know, we have to kind of stick with it. There are essentially two calendars, the Hob and the Sulkin. The Hob is the 365-day solar calendar, and it's made up of 18 months of 20 days. Okay, so well, wait a minute, that's 360, where do you get the other days? Well, you also have five evil days at the end of the cycle. And those five evil days are bad. <laughs> if kids are born on those days, they're probably going to be sacrificed because they're going to be born evil. Uh, and, and those days are just kind of added to make it. But they don't count to the 360-day cycle. They're kind of like nameless days. Then you have a 260-day calendar. And these are 20 months of 13 days. And this is the ritual calendar. And the best way to describe this is almost like cogs in a wheel. So you have the 13 numbered days, you have the 20 day cycle, and then you have the 360 uh, and you know with five day cycle over here. Now, when you work this together, that means that each day has a sulking date which is determined by you know a date number and the day on the 20 uh you know day calendar round and by the hob cycle this means that this ritualistic year will take nearly 52 years to repeat itself that's pretty impressive <laughs> it's a 52 year ritual cycle. So why why this 260 day cycle? No one really knows. Uh, people have postulated that this may be an attempt to harmonize a solar calendar with a lunar calendar, but at some point the 260 day cycle became completely unhinged from any need to match up with the moon and it just became its own thing in its own right. So this, these 52-year cycles repeat constantly, one after the other, and they add up to a series of rituals. So some rituals were only repeated once every 52 years, some are repeated every year, some are repeated whenever the cycle happens. But you will never have quite the same, you only have the same exact combination of sulking and hob once in a 52-year period. Which brings us to the long count. In addition to the ritual calendar, the Sulkin and the Hob, you also had the long count. And the long count was a way of keeping track of days. And not years, but days, because they didn't count those five evil days. <laughs> Just kind of interesting, but they didn't. And so you had a kin, which was one day, a huinal, which was 20 kin or 20 days, a tun, which is 18 huinal, which is essentially a year, but not quite. Then you'd have a katun, which is 20 tun, or a baktun, which is 20 katun, and it goes on and on and on until you have one baktun is 144,000 days. And so the long count was a count of 13 baktun. So 13 144,000 day periods. Now, no one knows why 
this number is significant. No one, and the funny thing is, is that the Bakhtun cycle, the long count, this 13 Bakhtun cycle, puts the origin of the Mayan universe way, way into the distant past. And the end of this 13 Bakhtun cycle wouldn't happen until well into the future. In fact, the 13 Bakhtun cycle did not end until uh, December 21st on 2012. Okay, And this is the famous inscription that caused so much ruckus. Michael Coe was one of the first to interpret this. And when he interpreted this, he believed at the time that this meant that the Mayans thought that 2012 would be the end of the universe. And that, of course, got us an awful lot of bad, uh, you know, memes on the Internet really terrible movie 2012 <laughs> and also it was just so infuriating because there were so many aztec calendars oh my gosh aztec calendars are not mayan calendars it's completely different but it was terrible uh and this was actually a misinterpretation he later changed this and later scholars thought well the truth is is it's probably not the end of the world it's just the end of the Bakhtun cycle and that mayans probably believed that this just begins the next long count. But this long count is actually very, very good because while we can't quite understand why they decided the count started so far into the past and why it didn't end until so far into their future, <clears throat> it does mean that, that we can um, come up with concrete dates because if you have one Mayan calendar date on, say, Kalakmul, and one calendar date in Copan, and they both use the long count, then you can say, hey, these two things happened on the same day. And so it's been a boon for archeologists to say, holy crap, we can, we can kind of put a history together. So thank goodness for that. Uh, but it was really obviously very important to them. The other thing that was very important to them was the Mesoamerican ball game itself. So when we see these, ball figure ball players we see them all over the mayan sphere but we also see them in uh, other mesoamerican contexts as well and it's something that'll continue on until um, the toltec period at least the mesoamerican ball game probably has reference to the hero twins and the original ball game the hero twins remember they become the sun and the moon they order the heavens they give order to the universe and so the playing of with this ball, this massive, heavy, solid rubber ball, uh, probably represents the movement of the sun through the heavens. And the goal of the game was to keep the ball in perpetual motion. There are two teams. Sometimes teams were as little as eight on a side. Sometimes there were as many as 40. We don't know what the rules were. Uh, but the only rules we do know for certain is that you couldn't hit the ball with your hands or your feet. It seems that you were limited to hitting it with your trunk, and that means predominantly your hip. Well, if you're hitting a solid rubber ball, that's gotta be brutal and a half. And so that means that your entire middle has gotta be wrapped in equipment, in layers and layers of clothing. And in fact, we have ceramic figures from all over the Mesoamerican world that show them with these heavily wrapped middles. Uh, to keep this ball from shattering their pelvises as they slid into it and knocked it away. Uh, in fact, it appears that you can see it a little bit here, sticking out here, that in addition to all this cloth, underneath this they had a wooden yoke. So they'd wrap their middle in a heavy layer of cloth, they would put this wooden yoke onto their body, strap it on, and then wrap more cloth around it. And we know what these yokes look like, because we have some of these ceremonial yokes. This is a yoke carved out of greenstone. Now again, no one believes that they were actually walking around with using a stone yoke. These were ceremonial objects that you know represent the ball gear, but it shows how important the ball gear was, that you have these ceremonial objects. This one is carved to resemble a frog. So there's the eye, there's the front leg, there's the hind leg. And you may ask, why a frog? Well, frogs, cross through the water. They cross from land to the water. And the water represents the boundary between this world and Shibulba, the underworld. 
And so they become minions of the underworld. They represent the underworld, the way to pass underneath. So, and when we look at the ball gear, we see uh, figures that clearly represent um, the underworld. We will see, again, more frogs. Uh, we will see the faces of gods. Sometimes skulls are very common representations of uh, various different deities. Uh, all things indicate that this is associated with the underworld. So the ball game itself is probably a game representing the fight with the underworld to keep the sun and the moon in perpetual motion and to keep the heavens going. The ball court itself is usually eye-shaped. And so here you can see a couple different ball courts. This is the ball court at Copan. This is another ball court up here. Uh, they came in every size and shape. Some of them are relatively small and narrow. The one at Chichen Itza is just colossal, but it has pretty much the same shape. It has a court. It has a large end zone on either end, although they're not goals in any meaningful way. It has this I-beam-like shape. The walls um, sometimes can be canted, so when you look at these, you can see Monte Albans are very low, uh, Copans are a little bit steeper, Chichen Itza's are practically straight up and down. So you can see it has these nearly 40 foot high walls um, that, well, I think it's 40 foot, I think it's closer to, to 20 foot, but. Uh, and no one's quite certain of the rules of the game here. We do know that the ball had to be in constant motion. We do know that you couldn't use your hands or feet. We do know that there were two separate teams, but we have no idea how scoring worked. We do know that one of the intents was that you had to bounce the ball through this stone hoop. <laughs> and just to give you a sense of this stone hoop and how big it is and how tall it is, yikes. I mean, you can't even imagine. And remember, you're doing this with your hips. You're sliding in and smacking this thing with your hip to keep it going. Really kind of impossible to think about, but must have happened. So this is the one at Chichen Itza. Fortunately, some hoops were lower. <laughs> some were about 10 foot off the ground and were a little bit bigger. Uh, but uh, one can't even imagine how difficult. Now, they have reconstructed this. There are teams now. They've reconstructed this as a sport in Mexico. And uh, it's now played in Mexico and Guatemala. Uh, they did it starting for tourists, but now there's whole leagues doing it. Uh, they don't play with a solid rubber ball because that's just murder. Uh, but they've they've established some rules, and amazingly, they you go look it up. It's really cool. You can do this. You can actually slide in and crack this thing with your hip, uh, low to the ground, and bounce it up and get it through a hoop. It's just staggering. So the ball game was absolutely critical, and was something that was played by elites, by warriors, nobles, etc. Now, the purpose of the ball game, again, is this replay, essentially, of the story of creation, of keeping the heavens and the universe, the sun and the moon, in order. But we can actually see the kind of end result of this by looking at this scene at Chichen Itza. Uh, this isn't very clear, so I've, I've got a drawing here that explains what's going. Here is the ball itself. Uh, notice that the ball has a skull on it, so that kind of gives you a sense of what's going on. Uh, the people also have kind of various other ball equipment. Not only do they have big things wrapped around their middle, they're holding onto what appear to be weights, uh, maybe to balance themselves out, give them a little more leverage. Here we have a person holding a head, a decapitated head, and here is the head that has been decapitated. This is the body. Notice that the head spurts out blood, and the blood is personified as snakes. And yet coming from this is a squash uh, plant with gourds and squash blossoms indicating life. So that was the purpose of this. Um, the uh, What's interesting is that the winners, uh, you know, we, we sometimes debate about the, the when the whole purpose of this was to, you know, as a prelude to sacrifice and human sacrifice, which begs the question, which sacri whose sacrifice are we talking about here? Uh, and sometimes it appears that it was the winners who were sacrificed, that this was a great honor to be sacrificed for the renewal of the world. 
really kind of incredible stuff. So we're going to talk about a few Mayan sites, a few classic Mayan sites, and then we'll move on to some of the post-classic stuff. So there's so many sites in here we could talk about. Oh my gosh, it's really, really beautiful. But we're, we're really going to only concentrate on three just to give you a flavor of this. We're going to talk about Palenque, which is kind of an early to late classic site. Uh, Tikal is a really important classic site, and Copan is a little bit later. Uh, Palenque is in modern day Mexico. Uh, and it's an early to er, middle classic site. It's really famous for its palace and also for the House of Inscriptions, which was a temple that served as the tomb of Lord Pakal, Kanich Chidaab uh, Pakal I, who lived around uh, these dates. The palace gives us a sense of how there really is no separation between church and state in this society. It is constructed as a temple on an elevated platform. It has a tower, uh, but it also has these massive relief sculptures uh, and these large porticos. Here you can see a kind of plan of it. It has these large open patios and courtyards to allow air, but it also has baths. Uh, there's quite a hydraulic system at Palenque. Uh, running water and other things. It's really incredible. It must have been very comfortable. It's the House of Inscriptions that's probably the most famous, though. Uh, again, another temple inside a temple inside a temple. Uh, this one seems to have been built deliberately, at least this iteration of it was built deliberately as a tomb for Lord Pakal. And they found a passageway that had been backfilled with earth, and the passageway led from the temple on top down to a tomb at the very bottom. One of the characteristic features of Mayan uh, architecture is this corbelled arch. They never really figured out the true arch, so what they would do is they would just bring out a register of stone until they got to a narrow enough place that they could kind of cap it off. And so this whole thing is vaulted in a corbelled vault. And at the bottom of the stairway was a massive limestone sarcophagus. And inside the sarcophagus was Lord Pakal himself. This is the lid to the sarcophagus, which is one of the great treasures of Mayan art. Uh, it's kind of difficult to see in the relief. It would have been painted in the original. But I do have a drawing. And we're going to walk through the iconography here so you can get a sense of what you're looking at. Uh, all around the outside are is again this sky banding, this indication of that this is happening in a spiritual realm. And then we're probably the heads of ancestors. Then at the very bottom we have what appears to be a cave. And the cave is personified as a monster. So this is the earth or the underworld. And notice that this is what we often call the Wheats Monster. The Wheats Monster is this thing that consumes you, that makes sense. The underworld is down, the underworld is in a cave, earth consumes you, makes lots of sense. So here you have these two mandibles, like beetle mandibles, that reach up to embrace Lord Pakal. So he is being eaten. He is being consumed by the underworld and passes through the underworld. But he doesn't stay there because he is sitting on a bench that has a glyph with a blossom and a conch shell and indicating his rebirth and so he reclines in a kind of fetal position but coming out of him is the world tree now the world tree is an interesting phenomenon it emerges out of the center the mayan world tree was kind of the axis mundi the center of the universe and it again gives this order to the universe notice that it is cross-shaped it also seems to have references to you know, corn as well, this idea of rebirth. So coming out of him is this emblem of rebirth. And then you can see that throughout the branches of the world tree is the sky serpent. So this is the Milky Way. So we have transpired from the underworld to the earthly realm to the heavenly realm. And at the very top, we have a kind of deity. Uh, which may be the feathered serpent, but it's probably some kind of bird deity. Notice also the masks, the pendant masks, which are again symbols of life. These would have been the greenstone masks. So 
Well, it's nobody knowing certain exactly what's going on here. The overwhelming emphasis is of one of the progression from the underworld to the overworld. The rebirth and the giving of life to reorder the universe and to give new life. Inside his tomb, his body was covered in a jade mask. It was pieced together in a mosaic to create uh, a kind of per permanent uh, flesh uh, that could not rot. That was the kind of value of jade. So really amazing. Again, all of this was a testament to the continuation of life and that the giving of life and death was just this passageway into rebirth. When we go down to Tikal, Tikal is a major site in Guatemala, again, early to late classic. And it's one of the few that may have been influenced or dominated by Teotihuacan. And it also seems to have influenced or domination over Copan, so a major center. If you go to Tikal today, you'll see this enormous acropolis here, and especially this courtyard with the stele. We'll talk more about the stele here. But this was actually just a small part. This is the only part of Tikal that's today significantly excavated. Almost all the rest of this, which we know, uh, it remains unexcavated. And that's typical of Guatemala's policy. They only excavate as they have money to do so. But in its prime, it was a, just a vast and unbelievable complex. And almost all of this is a monument in one way or another to dynastic succession. In the center, we have a courtyard of stele. A stele are these kind of upright tombstones like things, and in front of them are altars. And every single one of these is commemorates a ruler of Tikal. One of the earliest and one of the more fascinating is this one, Siwach Chong Kawil, or Stormy Sky. Stormy Sky is depicted on one side. His entire body is immersed in this beautiful headdress and also in all of this textile fabric. But on one side we have uh, warriors with spear throwers and one has a shield. And on the shield appears to be uh, a depiction of Klawak. Klawak is a Teotihuacan god. And on the back of this is a lengthy inscription, and on that inscription, uh, Siwash Chan Kawil says that he is the descendant of this Siwash Kaak, this, you know, bored in fire, smoke-eating frog <laughs> character who was not a king, but seems to be a general or a bureaucrat sent down from Teotihuacan who shows up and is not a noble but within short order is running everything, and he seems to be an agent of Spear Thrower Owl. So this is some of the best evidence that Teotihuacan really had this extensive power, that it was placing its people on the thrones of these powerful kingdoms. So he accedes to the throne in 411, and that's the time about that this monument was made, indicating his kind of ascension to authority and leadership. So the temples here uh, are actually made by Jason Chonkawil. So Siwaj Chonkawil uh, II is the guy who made Stele 31. But Temples 1 and Temples 2 are made by Jason Chonkawil, who's probably the biggest builder on site. So these are uh, Temples 1 and Temples 2 right here. Either side of this courtyard with all these beautiful Stile. And these would have just been magnificent monuments in their prime. Again, they have the, the talud and uh, tablero kind of structure, but because they're built in limestone, uh, they're really very well preserved. Uh, and so what you have is a temple at the top, which again represents a cave or a passage to the underworld, even though it's kind of up. Heaven is down in some ways. And it would have had this roof comb, this elaborate headdress uh, on the back of the building itself. These were built as dynastic monuments. So they are built as tombs and dynastic monuments to the ruler himself. Here you have again this beautiful example. Here's the roof comb. It's poorly, you know, preserved in this case, 
but it would have had a, a representation, in this case of a deity, with the inscription going into the, the actual uh, space. Now, above the doors, as you walked into these buildings, they had massive lintels, and miraculously, these lintels were carved in wood and actually are preserved. It's, you know, so we can only imagine, you know, I mean, we, we can see the stone, but we must have imagined that, you know, doorways, frames, etc., must have been carved in this ornate detail. So we're just getting a smattering of the, the beautiful form. Here we have, this is another to call king. This is Yakin Chon Kuil. And he is seated on a litter. Again, a litter is something to bear him up. And so he is lifted on this litter and he is beneath the arch of, again, the celestial serpent, showing that all of the heavens are ordered under him. This thing was carved, so here he is seated on the throne. You can see him seated on a throne on a litter, and all these individuals down here are lifting him up. And all of this is to indicate that, again, he was this victor. This one commemorated his victory over El Peru in 743. The only major uh, Mayan site in Honduras is at Copan, and it's again one of these early to late classic, and it seems to have this relation to Tikal. Tikal seems to have dominated it at some time. And some of the richest altars, stelae, and uh, sculpture come out of this place. It also has uh, one of the largest and most impressive ball courts. Uh, not much has been restored here. A lot of it is still consumed by the jungle, but it's famous for these huge statues, which were recorded by Stephen Catherwood. Stephen Catherwood came by uh, this region and made all these beautiful lithograph illustrations that were published in 1844, which caused a sensation. Uh, here you can see, this is one of the altars. This altar has a representation of one of the lords of the underworld, this kind of skull-like face. but. It's these beautiful stelae that really take the show. And again, they're just magnificent. One, for all of the incredible detailed carving and undercutting. I mean, these, these details, the getting all of these out are really incredible. Uh, the story here is the story of Ushaklajun Uwakawil. Don't ask me to say that again. Uh, who's more commonly known as 18 Rabbit. Almost all of these guys have a number. Numerology is very important, so they have a number associated to their title. He wears an elaborate turban. Uh, he is wrapped in cloth, but his entire body is encrusted in the symbols and the emblems that surround him. Uh, just to give you a sense of what's going on here, we have again the cave. This is those mandibles. This is the Wheats monster. This is the underworld. And in this case, the underworld is over the top of him, showing that he's inside the cave, the underworld has consumed him. And that tree of life symbol is still there, but this time it is, you know, part of his living clothing. And, you know, the serpent heads spill out over his arms, uh, completely immer immersing him in this. And so again, it's this idea of him dying, going to the underworld, being reborn, and in this case, coming forward as chalk. Chalk is this god of rain and lightning, this very important deity in the Mayan universe. Then we get to the hieroglyphic stair. There's this massive staircase at Copan, and in this, the staircase itself is carved into glyphs, and it's the largest continuous inscription of any of the Mayan sites. It records, again, mostly their battles and victories, and would have been this just incredible monument going up to the temple. Uh, this has been reconstructed, and unfortunately, when you have blocks that have, you know, glyphs on them, the reconstruction can make the translation a little difficult, but a massive restoration has been underway to uh, make sure that these have been reordered correctly. Really incredible. Well, that gives you a sense, at least a flavor, of how sophisticated these societies were, how beautiful their art was, uh, how incredibly uh, curvilinear and gorgeous it was. 
Uh, but somewhere around the near 900, something goes very, very wrong. And we really can't even explain what happened. Uh, the centers, the cultural centers of the Maya, just end up becoming abandoned. Uh, Copan, Tikal, uh, Piedras Negras, Calakmul, all of these sites end up more or less being abandoned. And no one really knows why. It's really amazing. We can recreate a lot of the history of Maya in the classic period because they're all chest thumping about kicking butt and taking names, but no one was left around to record the story of their collapse, which suggests that it was a, a, a wide based societal collapse. Uh, some theories. Uh, Mayans did require an awful lot of sacrifice, not to the extent of, say, the Aztecs, but if you have a society that's based on ritualized warfare, where the principal reason is you're going at raiding other people, is to get prisoners of war and bringing them back so that they can be sacrificed, uh, that is a culture dominated by elites. But it's not the elites who are paying the price and ultimately getting sacrificed. Maybe, you know, I mean, in some cases, warriors clearly were being sacrificed because they considered it a great honor to be sacrificed for their gods. But a lot of these prisoners of wars are just ordinary Joe Blows fighting on behalf of these elites. So there might have been a complete collapse of society that, you know, what are we doing, um, you know, fighting for these elites? And people just might have simply walked away. And walking away, these kingdoms no longer had the resources to maintain these sacred centers. So it was some kind of dissolution of societal cohesion. Some people have suggested maybe it was a, a sudden collapse, war, famine, or plague. Uh, a common theory today that's popular is that there was an overextended resources, that they had simply cut down too much of the forest and they really had overtaxed the environment to the point that they could no longer sustain themselves. Or it could be a combination of all of these things. But whatever the cause, it means that we have a complete movement of people this area ceases to have any significant monuments built in it after the year 900, but this area flourishes for another 400 years. And so some people have stipulated that maybe this is a migration, that maybe there was a societal collapse, but the elites or whoever was left went north into the lowlands and that this is where the new civilization takes place. Uh, while we call this era and this region the classic period, the truth is that the Yucatan period is, at least in terms of population and numbers, just as big. The cities are just as big. I remember I was having a class with a professor, and I'm like, so if it's just as big, why is the other era the classic era? And he says, eh, because that's what archaeologists like. It may not have been uh, the classic era in the minds of these people. So, so there is this really dramatic change in society, but they still have, you know, a whole kind of second golden age up here in the Yucatan. But the art changes dramatically, and it may be evidence of influence from other cultures. So the northern lowlands are really dominated by a lot of regional styles. There's the Rio Beck style, the Puk style, the Chene style, and all of them are much more geometric, much more oriented towards kind of design and away from naturalistic, organic representation of the human figure. And you can see where they're all kind of located. The Rio Beck is down here and this, the Chene style is here, and then you have the kind of Puk style, which is everything else. And then you have Chichen Itza, which is just completely different again. It's a completely different style. So what's interesting is we actually end up with more diversity at this time. You can immediately see the difference because they move away from naturalistic representation of figures to repeating patterns. And what we call mosaic stonework, just blocks laid down on top of blocks to create these walls. This is, these are all masks, and these masks with these long curly noses represent Chalk, Chalk the rain god. Here you can see a Chalk mask built into the architecture, but you can see how it's just this repeating regimented design, much more geometric in orientation. I love these crazy curly teeth, but you can see how this is made up of individual blocks instead of being a, a single solid monolith or sculpture like those stele down at Copan or at Tikal, uh, it's going to be put together in this mosaic style. 
Uh, the Chene style is really fun because you have these entrances to temples and these entrances are personified as mouths. So here you see the teeth, here you see the eyes. This is so freaking metal, I love this stuff. Here, the lower jaw, you can see the teeth here. Oh, the lower jaw. So every time you walk into this thing, it's, you know, it's like it's eating you, it's munching you. You are being swallowed and being brought into the underworld. You have this kind of birth and rebirth. The real Beck style is just bizarre as well. The real Beck style holds on to some of the ideas of the pyramids and the roof combs. But instead of building full-size pyramids, they built these sham pyramids. So you could see that this still has these tiers. It still has a staircase. Good luck getting up that staircase. <laughs> and it has a temple up there, but the temple has nothing in it. It's just a sham door. Uh, you can see it a little better in this example. So they retain the knowledge of these pyramids that existed before, but eh, we're not going to build full-size pyramids, and so we'll build sham pyramids, which means that the pyramids by this point really were kind of symbolic more than anything else. Not that they don't build pyramids, they still build pyramids. Uh, this is the Pyramid of the Magician. This is Ushmal. Uh, this is one of these late classic or terminal classic pyramids. Uh, here you can see it has its levels. And then you have this wonderful kind of, again, uh, Chenez or Puk style entrance where you have this mouth representing the mouth of the underworld uh, that consumes you with these eyes that look down on you. Yeah, go in, it's fine. I'm sure there's no booby traps. Uh, I mean, it's just scary. And it's supposed to be. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, and here we have what's known as the nunnery and the governor's palace, which again is at Ushmal. And here you can see this beautiful mosaic work, this incredible uh, series of ashlar masonry, and then built over the top of it, the masonry is organized into textile patterns. Uh, again, with a representation of a deity here, and then uh, these buildings are connected again by these corbelled arches. So if you've ever seen Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Los Angeles um, works, he was very influenced by a World's Fair where he saw a reproduction of um, a building from Ushmal in uh, the Chicago World's Fair. And he loved these textile blocks um, that had this wonderful kind of pattern. And so if you've ever seen the Ennis House or some of his other buildings in LA, that's where the inspiration for that came. So he had a Mayan period there in the 1920s. I'm sure you've seen the Ennis House. It's, it was in Blade Runner. It's been in every sci-fi movie. It's been in lots of movies. It was even in, it was even in Karate Kid 2. You know, Silver, that terrible guy. You know, he, that's the house he lives in. Okay, now something to go search for. Now it's a, a little bit of pop culture. So while you have the Pook style, and while you have the Rio Beck style, the Chene style, these really dynamic styles that are more geometric, you have another style again at Chichen Itza. And Chichen Itza is just utterly unique. Uh, it is a post-classic site, and it probably has influence from the Toltec or from Tula, because we see motifs here that we find at no other place in the Mayan sphere, but we see them up in the Mexican basin. That strong emphasis, the strong evidence that we have some kind of elite group coming down and establishing a Toltec colony here, uh, we don't really know. What we do know, again, is this is a pilgrimage site. Uh, when we look at this site, again, not a city, it's actually a ceremonial center. And we're going to be looking at a couple of monuments. We'll be looking at the Castillo, uh, also come, called the Temple of the Feathered Serpent. We'll be looking at the Ball Court. We've already looked at the Ball Court, but the Temple of the Jaguar, which is right up there, and the Temple of the Warriors, briefly. But what's interesting is these are all just additions to the site because the site was already sacred. On the site are a number of cenotes, and cenotes are sinkholes. There's the big one there but there's also another one down there. There's quite a few over the area. So interestingly enough, as lush as the Yucatan is, it doesn't get a lot of rainfall. It gets a lot of winds off the Caribbean. It's kind of dry, but it's got plenty of water, but it doesn't have any rivers. Why? How can it do this? Well, it has springs, and the springs come up from these sinkholes. It's, uh, the whole area is noted for its cart topography. 
Karts topography is where you have these sinkholes and underwater caverns and water seeps through and creates stalagmites and stalactites. It's really quite beautiful. Uh, and these were sacred in Mayan times because they were believed to be passages to Shibulba. Today, tourists uh, dive into them and enjoy them. Uh, but it's important to note that there's a lot of skeletons down there. A lot of bodies, a lot of finds down there. <laughs> a little bit creepy, but that's the reality of it. Uh, so these were sacred sites for sacrifice as well. And so that's why people were coming to this region. And so that's why these buildings get built. Uh, again, these are all been heavily restored. Uh, Mexico likes to restore its monuments so that they are accessible to tourists. Uh, this is what the Castillo or the Temple of the Feathered Serpent looked like uh, up until the early 20th century. So a lot of what you're seeing here is restored, but there's reasons to believe it's pretty accurate. This is a fascinating temple because while it has an entrance into the sanctuary of the temple here. It has an entrance on all four sides and a stairway on all four sides. That's pretty unusual and seems more indicative of the kind of things we're seeing from the Mexican basin. It has that talud tablero kind of style and it has two serpent heads that frame uh, the stairway. As you get up to the stairway, the temple has two massive serpents that form the columns. You'll see these again and again. And on the interior, you have a chakmul. This is the first chakmul you've ever seen. Chakmul are very typical in the Mexican basin. You'll see chakmul amongst Toltecs and Aztecs and uh, Clash Collins and everyone else. But these are the only chakmul that we see in the Mayan sphere. This is not a traditional Mayan form of sacrifice. And it's an altar in the shape of a person. And in the Aztec and Toltec context, the living heart would be removed from uh, a person so that it was still beating when it was removed. It was cut very quickly from the body and then the living heart was regarded as a kind of living jewel and it was placed here on the altar of the figure. Does that mean that's what's happening here? And the answer is we don't know because the truth of the matter is we know very little about the exact nature of Mayan sacrifice. We know a lot about the nature of Toltec and Aztec sacrifice because it was recorded, it was recorded down. But the Mayans didn't record the exact nature of their human sacrifice. So we could only infer from Aztec examples. But in this case, the presence of the Chakmul suggests, yeah, this is probably very similar. Uh, here we have a jaguar throne, which itself is probably another altar and not actually a throne uh, here, again, with the head turned this way and a surface uh, to receive uh, the sacrificial offerings. Serpents are everywhere, and so we see that the stairways of many of the monuments have these beautiful serpent heads, and the tongues come out. And you can see that the serpents are covered not in scales, but in feathers. And it has long been suggested that on certain days of the year, the shadow of the edge of the pyramid will actually create this undulating pattern meant to represent the body of the serpent uh, the head here. That's certainly not impossible, but again, you always have to remember these are restored, so you have to take this with a grain of salt, but I do think that that's a very logical possibility. Elsewhere, we have the Temple of the Warriors, which is a large temple with a series of columns, but I think the most interesting thing is that it is surrounded by this massive forest of columns. So in front of the temple itself is a large area of columns, and there is a debate about whether this would have been roofed. Some suggest this would have been roofed with uh, temporary roofing made out of uh, palm fronds or other material, and that this is a marketplace, uh, but it would have been a sacred marketplace. That is a place where you would have bought sacrifices, things like animals and other things, to offer on your behalf at the temple. Uh, but we're still not entirely certain what this columned, you know, hall is. Uh, and some believe it may have been always open to the sky. In other places, we can clearly see that there meant, meant to be wooden beams that went over the top of it. If you go up the stair here to the Temple of the Warriors, 
we have two more of those beautiful serpent columns. There they are. And so you can see that they have the mouths of serpents and then the serpent bodies bend back and then you can see the rattles of the serpents and then it even has this tail made out of feathers. I love how some of the feather tail feathers bend in different ways. This is naturalistic detail, it's fun. Uh, oh, I gotta get a, front, a couple of these built in the front of my house. And then we have a chakmul again. We'll talk more about this chakmul when we get back to the Toltecs, but we you know, I'm going to leave that for a different time. But again, Chakmul is a human figure with an offering plate. And does this indicate that the practice here was similar to the Toltecs? We don't know. And lastly, we have the Temple of the Jaguar, which is a, a nearly beautiful, perfect, intact temple up here on the top of the ball court. Look at how high that is. Maybe it is 40 feet. Yikes, that's really high. You imagine hitting a rubber ball through that hoop with your hip. Oh, I can't get up in the morning without my hips cracking. I think it'd kill me. Oh, boy. But here on the backside, we have a sacred spring and then a stairway that gives you access to the temple. And the temple is just one of the best preserved uh, Mayan temples that we have. Here, again, are those serpent columns. The serpent heads uh, stick their tongues out and then their bodies bend up to form uh, a basis for the lintel. Here you can get a closer view of them and see how beautifully detailed they are. But all over the Temple of the Jaguar, we have a whole series of beautiful reliefs showing warriors in all of their finery. And then it abruptly comes crashing down. We don't know what happens to Chichen Itza again, but the Mayan world suffers another collapse. So. The first collapse is pretty severe, but then you have this second flourishing of Mayan civilization in the Yucatan, in the northern uh, lowlands of the Yucatan Peninsula. And then by the year 1300, everything seems to go sideways again. And again, we don't know why. War, famine, uh, loss of societal cohesion, we don't know. The temples are abandoned, they're no longer maintained. It's true that when the Spaniards arrive, there are still thousands of Maya living. They are still preserving a great deal of their civilization. They were still preserving the books and the religion and a lot of the practice. But the the, cent, the city centers centered around these urban elites who demanded sacrifice and tribute, that seems to have gone the way of the dodo. And it seems to have been a complete and total collapse at that point. Why? We can only guess. But it's this complete and total collapse that then moves us in firmly into the post-classic period. We sometimes call this period the terminal classic because <laughs> it's the end of the classic. Uh, sometimes they call it post-classic Maya. There's debates over, you know, where do you end the classic? You ended at 900 or, you know, you ended at 1300. Uh, there's no real consensus on where this is supposed to be. But after this, we're not going to have a major civilization in the Mayan sphere again. Uh, so long before the Spaniards showed up, Mayan civilization was ended. And it's not until uh, the Spaniards show up that we have another collapse. But from this time forward, the shift of the focus of civilization is going to move to the Mexican basin. It's going to move and it's going to be the Toltecs and the Aztecs. And so that's who we'll talk about next time. Thanks for hanging in there. I really appreciate it. Oh my gosh. If you want to hear more about this, I am doing lectures for my Latin American class and I, I, I go into more detail. I talk about more artifacts and just, just this stuff is so beautiful. It's just so cool. All right. Uh, so if you want to go check those out, those are on YouTube too for my Latin American class. I go into a little bit more detail than this, but we got to move on. We have so much to cover. So we'll hit Aztecs and Toltecs next time. Thanks so much. See ya. Bye-bye.